On Nationwide this evening, Mary's personal video diary of a heart-rending visit to the streets of Calcutta. She feels her helplessness in the face of appalling poverty and meets some of the Irish who are there to respond to the pleas in the eyes of the children. John O'Shea, the founder of Goal, was recently honoured at the Entrepreneur of the Year Awards for his work on behalf of the poor people in the third world. We'll be having a chat with John shortly, but first of all, we're going to take a look at the difference he has made to many thousands of destitute people in Calcutta. I travelled there with Goal and saw the work that the organisation does on behalf of street children in the city. And I don't have to tell you, it was an eye-opening and a life-changing experience. Downtown Calcutta struck me like any other big city. Impressive buildings, wide boulevards, reminders of colonial times, and of the woman who tried to make the world take notice of the abject poverty of Calcutta. Mother Teresa referred to these people as the poorest of the poor. She lived among them until her death in 1997, and her missionaries of charity still walk the streets of Calcutta bringing love and kindness to the millions of people who live on the streets. I found it hard to get my head around the fact that Calcutta is about the same size as Dublin and yet it's got a population of 18 million, 5 million of whom live on the streets. They sleep everywhere and anywhere, under bridges, on the pavement, on cardboard. They bring their soap and toothpaste to the horse troughs to wash in the mornings. They fill their billy cans from the water in the gutters. Many of them are children who live alone or in gangs on the streets. My heart went out to these street children who have no alternative but to live without cover in these monsoon rains. They beg, they scavenge in the dumps for something to eat or for things like rubber bands or bottle tops, anything they can sell. The streets of Calcutta are not safe. Apart from the squalor, the filth, the hunger, the junkies in doorways, there's the risk from paedophiles and child traffickers. These roam the platforms at Sialda, Calcutta's main railway station, where many children sleep at night. Over the station wall, Goal runs a drop-in centre for the railway children. Two concrete block rooms with no furniture and one shower. The children sleep on the bare floor and they feel safe and secure. They come and go as they please. This is a sanctuary when the depravity of the railway platform gets too much for them. They don't know that abuse isn't part of normal life. You know, little girls can get money from men to go into the cinema with them and then they do whatever they're doing there. And that's, why, that's what they do to survive. These children don't have anything and they're abused on a daily basis and they're still walking around like they're fine. Next step up from the drop-in centre is the halfway house. There's one for boys and one for girls, where children rescued from the streets eat, sleep, play and learn, all in one room. They've got a locker reach of which they're very proud. They're happy and they're lucky. Goal will send them to school when they're ready for it. Their cycle of poverty is broken. They have hope and a future to look forward to. Hope is not a word that immediately comes to mind when visiting the slums down by the port of Calcutta. Here, squalor, poverty and misery are the order of the day. For me, this was the nearest thing to hell on earth. Wild black pigs with their piglets roam around and snuffle through the filth and the tacky grey sludge caused by the heavy rains in this monsoon season. At one point, I was quite literally stuck in the mud when a rat ran in front of me. A feeling of utter helplessness swept over me. I felt like crying. The mud streets are lined with makeshift houses with tarpaulin roofs that are totally inadequate shelter against the heavy rains. The stench is nauseating. There's no sanitation in this slum of 2,000 souls, most of them illegal immigrants who left the neighbouring state of Bihar in search of a better life. The Right Track project provides a ray of hope here. 
actually uh, they are coming for uh, this is an informal education center they are coming for one year and after one year we uh, we will uh, mainstream them every year so they kind of get used to schooling here and then next year they go to uh, a normal primary school yeah. In spite of the lack of government intervention and amenities, the young people in the slums provide their own entertainment. They run a soccer street league and proudly display their trophies and shields. As I watched them play in the mud, I thought of the times we bemoan the inadequate sports facilities for our youngsters. Everything is relative. I found it very frustrating to think of these people living in such destitution in a country which has the fastest growing technology industry in the world and where there is no food shortage. To get to the slums, you pass by fully stocked grain stores at the entrance to the port. The Child in Need Institute opened its doors in 1978 and has been providing education in childcare and nutrition to Indian health workers ever since. And our basic issues are then nutrition, that is for the mother and the children and especially for the critical ages of life, following life cycle approach like pregnant mother during pregnancy period, lactation period, then for up to two years of childhood, ch children, because that is the most vulnerable year, a vulnerable time, and then the adolescent periods also. The village mothers, they, their saying is that we didn't get any kind of information in our life, but we don't want that our children, they will do the same mistake, they should not. So you please come up with us and you please impart your valuable lessons, that is to our children. For me, this place was truly inspirational. There's an atmosphere of confidence, commitment and hope for the future. The courses are residential and the original building is now used as dormitories as the Noel Carroll building, financed by Goal at a cost of €300,000, now houses a state-of-the-art education centre on three floors. It's got classrooms, library, computer room and conference centre. India is a male-dominated society where men call the shots and the women very often do not know that, they, that their husbands have multiple partners. But our job is to curb that rise in HIV AIDS, which can be only be done through a behavior change. I think it's more for the men to understand that they have to have safe sex, otherwise they'll bring the disease back to their families. To go from the Child in Need Institute to the Rehabilitation Centre for Children is akin to stepping back in time. I thought I'd seen all the heartache Calcutta had to offer, but there was more here where children with disease-induced physical deformities are treated. The RCFC has about 100 patients at any time, some of them rescued from the streets and some of them reluctant to have their legs straightened because they're afraid they'll make less money begging. The hospital authorities are aware of this and provide vocational training to the young people before they're discharged. The staff at the RCFC perform eight operations a week. The conditions are very basic, but the children are well looked after and in the case of babies, their mothers move into the hospital. So we have made it a point that will allow the mother to stay with the baby not exceeding three years. Less than three years, they should stay here. Less than three years. So for three, the, these mothers will stay here stay, for three stay, years. Stay, yeah, yeah. And might they have other children? They have other children. And who will look after the other children? There are some members in the family, some the other joint family. The family. No, no. A glimmer of hope there for some lucky children, but to see real hope for the future, you've got to look to the Sunderbans Delta, a collection of eight villages about 100 miles south of Calcutta. The idea behind this project, funded by Goal and run by local people, is to provide children and teenagers with a quality of life their parents didn't have, with a view to keeping them in the Sunderbans and away from the destitution of Calcutta. The project manager is a local man and he knows what life was like beforehand. People, uh, was, uh, there is uh, no uh, health facility. There is, people are not uh, thinking the better life and uh, better education. And, to, and uh, really, uh, uh, people are not expecting this kind of facilities. So after introducing the, this uh, project, it is a great change among the particular the health. Uh, so our, from November 
onwards. Already we constructed a lot of sanitations and uh, really particularly uh, the women are very happy for the particular the water and sanitation projects. The people now have clean water, sanitation, solar lights, better schools and they're not going to stop there. Within the next 10 months, we're talking about constructing almost uh, 1,400 latrines, a few more schools, at least four primary schools and a two uh, secondary level and high secondary level schools here. And then there are 15 tube wells to be dug and then 100 households will be having some sort of solar lighting, which would mean tube lights and a couple of tube lights so that the children in the house can actually study after dark. Back in Calcutta, and there's an assault on the senses. The heat is oppressive. The noise of traffic and the honking of horns is relentless. The smell of petrol fumes is sickening. But there's no doubt that the greatest assault is on the emotions. It's heartbreaking to see so many people living in appalling conditions, totally destitute. Five five euros of age, 250 rupees, and say, look at it this way, the average money a rickshaw driver would get is a thousand rupees, about 20 euro a month. So he's feeding four children and a wife on that, and they're surviving. So you can do an awful lot of money, you can send them to school, we buy teaching materials, just things like that, little things that go so far and change their lives just enormously. Since John O'Shea founded Goal in 1977, the organization has sent 1,100 volunteers to work in the developing world alongside more than 2,000 local staff and has spent more than 300 million euro on development aid. In Calcutta, Goal has rescued more than 8,500 street children from a life of misery and abuse. Mother Teresa got it right when she said these people are the poorest of the poor, but she also said we should help one person at a time. Well, there you've got a fair insight into the utter destitution in Calcutta and the work that's being done there by Goal. John O'Shea is the founder. First of all, John, congratulations on the Social Entrepreneur of the Year Award. Now, it all started for you in Calcutta 28 years ago. I presume you've got a special place in your heart for the city. Yeah, you could say, Mary, it's our spiritual home. I went out there in December of 1977. I had £211 in my pocket. I was going to do the Divil and All, save the world. I didn't, of course, nor did Goal. But this year we'll probably spend about two million uh, in the city. Uh, we've run about 80 or 90 different type of projects. You've seen some of them there on the film. Uh, and I'd say there are many hundreds of thousands of people alive today as a result of the prodigious work done by the goalies, by the missionaries, by the indigenous groups. And I know that you work tirelessly, but do you ever come across, say, little nuances of charity fatigue? No, there's no such word. That's, a, a, I think, a, something coined by the media. For whatever reason, I don't know. I will criticise the Irish on many things. Uh, unquestionably, there are many reasons for criticising the Irish. But in one aspect, generosity, we are top of the league. Whether it's a child in Ireland who's in dire need of some form of support, I work with the Simon Community, a terrific organisation, before starting Gold, so I'd be fairly clued into poverty in Ireland, or whether it's children in the third world. The Irish will rally around. Look what they did for the victims of the tsunami, and today what they're doing for the victims of the Pakistan earthquake. So there's no such thing as uh, fatigue in this, in this context. And what does winning an award like this mean to you and to Gold? It doesn't mean an awful lot to me, really, because I believe, uh, Mary, it is uh, really a reflection on the great work, the phenomenal work of the doctors and nurses, the unsung heroes. I may be the face of the organisation. I don't have to go out and work at the coal face for two to, in some cases, 17 and 18 years. So I'm delighted that their work has been recognised. And if you like, somebody had to collect it. I was the only one available on the night. So I'm delighted for them. And I hope that they realise that this award was given to them for this Herculean effort that they've made over so many years. Well, congratulations again on the award and the best luck to you and to Goal and the Goalies in the future. 
To make the presentation to the Social Entrepreneur of the Year, could you please welcome on stage the Chairman of the Judging Panel, Dennis O'Brien. For many blessed with entrepreneurial talent, the desire to affect change and to make a difference finds expression outside of a commercial context. This year, the judging panel wished to recognize the contribution of one such individual whose lifetime work embodies these values. Almost 30 years ago, Irish press journalist John O'Shea had an idea of how he could make a difference. And with the dogged spirit of a true entrepreneur, he immediately set about putting it into action. John's vision was to organise fundraising events for the world's poorest people, which harnessed the goodwill of sporting celebrities. A feat only made possible by his unique powers of persuasion. Well, how does anybody get involved with goal? <laughs> John O'Shea, of course, you know, and uh, I've known him from probably since I probably started playing snooker and, and uh, he just came up and told me that I'm doing something for a goal and that was it, so <laughs> how could I refuse? <laughs> I think he's one of the real sort of unsung heroes of, of, of our modern day society for all the work that he does for goal, uh, you know, in Africa and India and elsewhere. In 1977 when John set up goal he had a vision of what a goal was going to be and he took that opportunity and has developed it into 15 countries Goal now employs about 2,000 people worldwide working in very, very tough conditions uh, in, in the whole area of humanitarian aid, usually successful. For every euro uh, of money that Goal receives, only five cents is used on administration. I mean, that's real efficiency. To really appreciate the value that Goal get out of every euro or every dollar or every pound sterling they collect, you need to go to the field and to see the projects in action. I saw them in Calcutta. It was a real eye-opener. And what made it better, John was with us. And to see John in action. I think it's Uncle John they caught him out there. You know, the young kids. You think he lived there all his life. The real entrepreneur works quickly. They don't dwell on an idea for a long time. How should we do this? John thinks of a way of going about it straight away. I think it works for him. And nobody refuses John. Goal has spent over 300 million euro on its humanitarian programs. From Angola to India, from Honduras to Sierra Leone, the impact of John O'Shea's work continues to be felt. And that means that we all need each other. We should all look outside our own little realms at times to see is there something elsewhere that we could help. And I think it helps your own little business, your own little world, as well as helping the other. And I think that's the link that Goal and other associations like it, they act as a bridge or a link between different strands of society. The winner of the Social Entrepreneur of the Year is Gold's John O'Shea. You're privileged there to have seen the greatest sporting commentator there ever was or ever will be. An incredible guy. Um, Mr. Minister, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm thrilled, embarrassed and almost humbled uh, to get this award, but uh, I'll treasure it, I can assure you. But I'll accept it on behalf of the goalies, the doctors, nurses, engineers, accountants even, by the way, Ernst and Young, we use plenty of them, we're still looking for more. 
that have uh, slaved and worked at the coal face, the coal face since 1977, I suppose there are about 1,300 expats, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of locals, but the best projects which we have done in that period have unquestionably been the ones where there's been an entrepreneurial spirit. Like to get aid to the poor of the third world, in my humble opinion, is one of the hardest things on earth to do, to really reach those in greatest need. The obstacles are so great. So unless there is an entrepreneurial aspect to it, you're going to fail. And there are many failed projects throughout the third world. I came back from Calcutta last evening and I saw many, many uh, projects where thousands of people uh, had their lives enriched and enhanced. And in all of them, there was that entrepreneurial uh, spirit. I believe also that the poor of the third world will remain poor forever in their millions until such time as they can try and spawn another Mandela, people of his ilk. And the only way that will happen is through education. And from the springboard of education will hopefully come entrepreneurs. So I'm hoping, I'm looking at people, and I want to congratulate all of the winners here tonight, and to me, all of you are winners for being here. But I would like to ask you to consider, instead of the old holiday in Derry and Anne, and there's no nicer place on the planet, even though we lost the bloody match, I would appeal to you to take a week or two out of your life, as me Hall and others, Mary, has done in recent years, and just go and watch people eke out a precarious existence in rubbish heaps where they're fighting with rats for sustenance and being treated like animals by their fellow human being. Because of what you have up here, you will be able to provide them with an avenue out of that morass of misery. So it's just a thought, but I would love really to see you do it because the people of the third world, the millions of them, need that entrepreneurial support. So again, a thousand thanks to all of you for, for being here and for the headbangers who decided to give me an award. So Dennis, thank you very much. Thank you.